And what we did was we just kind of unpacked. You know, we take these southern communities to a 100-mile radius around these cities. You get to 50% of the black population. Now, what do they need, right? And it's enablement of capital, enablement of digital systems. And, and so we're working on that, right? And I would think every corporation on the planet or in the world, in the U.S. at least, would say this makes a ton of sense and it works because um, it does work, yeah. right? You, we, we show you digitize a – CDFI, Community Financial Development Institution, or MDI, guess what? They can lend out orders of magnitude more money and not increase the risk on the money in, you know, that they're lending out. Mm. And it changed the economic condition of that community. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. I'm pleased to welcome a legendary investor and philanthropist, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Vista Equity Partners. Widely been recognized for both his business achievements and philanthropic giving. Forbes has named him one of the 100 greatest living business minds. Please welcome Robert F. Smith. Lincoln Hills, Colorado, uh, beautiful scenery, beautiful place, a lot of history. Give us a background on how we got here, you know, your history, how you got here, and kind of the the semblance of, you know, what this means to, you know, not just you, but our community. Yeah. So, hey, listen, welcome again uh, to Lincoln Hill. So glad you all could could come and visit this this storied and historical place. Um, and we're celebrating our centennial this year. You know, it's uh, Lincoln Hills was founded in 1922. Uh, and I think there's a there's a lot of significance around the entrepreneurial spirit that still you know, that resides in this place, which created its founding. Uh, It was founded as a place where African-Americans could come and I'll say find peace and serenity. You know, this was a time where, not that we don't have that today in many communities, where African-Americans were uh, under attack. You know, I think this is three years after the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre, which again, as you all know, part of my family came through Tulsa, ended up in Pueblo and then ended up in, in Denver, Colorado. And the founders of Lincoln Hills um, came here to create a resort community. Think about this, a place where African-Americans could come in the summers and uh, relax and enjoy each other's company. And uh, what they did was they created a a, a development corporation. They plotted out 1,700 acres or 1,700 uh, lots where you could actually now buy a lot and build uh, a cabin and bring your families. And of course, there are only 4,000 African-Americans in Colorado at the time. So of course they had to go outside. So that's why we had people from, you know, Kansas and Oklahoma, African-Americans, you know, Missouri, but you guys have seen the list of the original, some of the original uh, owners here. Uh, And then uh, they invited and had a number of very storied guests, everyone from Duke Ellington, you know, Louis Armstrong, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, uh, Sarah Vaughn, they all came here. They all came, they vacationed, they held salons, they actually created a, a, a place of engagement and peace and serenity. Uh, and my family had the good fortune of being a part of it. Um, my grandmother was best friends with the, with the founder's wife. Um, and uh, she brought my father and his seven siblings here every summer growing up. Uh, she was a school teacher. And uh, in that time, you know, school teachers didn't get paid in the summer. So I'm sure she brought them up here to ensure that they had you know, kind of a meal every day or at least a couple of meals every day. And uh, when I spent time with, you know, then my aunts, my father and talking about it, you could you could hear in their voices the importance of a place where they felt safe and a place where they could commune with nature and a place uh, where they could actually be together as a community, uh, not living in, in fear. And Lincoln Hills provided that. Uh, I had the good fortune of being able to, uh, a decade or so ago, uh, buy and then expand the, you know, what was the traditional Lincoln Hills and recreate a lot of that. You all have seen what Lincoln Hills looked like before. It was yes. a mining tailing. Yes. Yeah, crazy. We say, oh, yeah, resort community. And then you yeah. look at it like, wait, that's a mining tailing, right? Yeah. But it was the outdoors and the great outdoors that they were, uh, uh, after, you know, they created the Phyllis Wheatley branch of the YWCA because the YWCA didn't allow African American girls in. So, you know, the Phyllis Wheatley branch uh, had a thing called Camp Nazoni, which means beautiful in Navajo. And so you'll see lots of pictures of the Camp Nazoni yep. uh, women, young girls who were here in the summers. 
Uh, and so we've created a lot of that. You know, I've got Camp Nazoni uh, camp where we have a program for African American girls for horseback riding in the summer. We get over 10,000 inner city kids as part of our programming through Lincoln Hills Cares. Um, they do everything from fly fishing to rock climbing to uh, outdoor nature experiences, learning about, you know, flora and fauna, uh, falconry, even we do here in the summers. And we have programs for uh, aged out foster kids here in the wintertime. Um, because our foster care program doesn't do an adequate job of uh, helping these kids as they're in college, what happens when they close the dorms down and they have nowhere to go because they're no longer in the group homes, right? And so we house about 30 or so of them every winter uh, and uh, have celebrations of the holiday season and we cook gumbo together and that sort of thing. So just feel very proud uh, that I have a chance to be the steward of this place um, to continue to create a place of peace and serenity. Uh, for the communities that I that I care about. Beautiful. So obviously you spent a lot of time here in Lincoln Hills. You told us a lot about the history, but you're from an hour away in Denver. Can you go back and tell us about your upbringing and uh, where it all started and how you embarked on this journey to get to sure. where you are now? Sure. Um, you know, again, my, my father's part of the family uh, ended up settling here um, in, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the pathway through Texas and Oklahoma into Pueblo and then into, into Denver. And my, you know, my grandma, like I said, was a, was a teacher. My, uh, my father was very studious. He ended up getting his doctorate degree in education, went to, uh, same high school. I went to Denver East high school. Um, then went to Denver university, um, got at all of his degrees there. Uh, and my mother grew up in Washington, DC, went to what's called the storied, uh, Dunbar high school. Dunbar. You got it. Uh, she was, you know, valedictorian, brilliant, still the most brilliant woman I'm for a person I've ever met. Uh, and she's 87. Uh, hi mom, just saying hi to you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, she moved out here to get her master's degree, ultimately got her doctorate degree in education as well. So, you know, my family is very focused on education. My grandmother, like I said, was really focused on building, uh, you know, a community, uh, of, of educated, uh, kids, um, you know, she was she 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 developed curriculums for special education. She also owned a small um, kind of soda fountain, oh. and uh, so my dad has uh, six beautiful sisters uh, that I, and, and and then his younger brother um, created. I, I call it a nice environment for a lot of kids to kind of you know participate in 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 the soda fountain and what they did. They sold tamales and all sorts of stuff. I remember my dad telling me stories about going up to Red Rocks and selling tamales for a dollar when they had activities there. And I'm like, how'd you get up there? It's a long way to go. They take the bus. But um, a big part of that was being a part of the community. And I know growing up, my father, uh, you know, he was a chairman of the local YMCA. And this is where we all learned how to play basketball. Not as good as you guys, obviously, <laughs> uh, and to swim and to learn how to, you know, do crafts and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, hiking and camping were all part of that that experience. Um, but my life changed, frankly, when I went to I went to Denver East High School, and my one of my teachers, I, I got a chance to, to participate in uh, coding. It was, uh, you know, the introduction of computers. Right. And I asked the teacher, I said, well, well how does this thing actually work? It was run by this thing called a transistor. And I was like, well, you know, who invented that? And he said, oh, this place called Bell Laboratories. And I said, well, you know, where, where are these folks? And they actually had a Bell Labs here in Denver. So I called them, and I said, hey, you know, I'm interested in uh, – I'm a junior in, in high school and I said, I'm interested in getting a job uh, for the summer. And they said, well, you got to be, you know, between your junior and senior year in college. And uh, we have internships. I said, oh, great. I'm a junior in high school. I'm getting, I'm taking eight, you know, AP classes, getting all A's and those. So it's just like being in college. Uh, and human resources director said, no, it isn't. Call us when you're a junior in college. So I literally called this human, re we were talking about this human resources director every day. And back then we had these things called pay phones. And I, Finish my my class and I go in and I put a dime in a payphone and I call her and I you know she stopped you know every day for two weeks she stopped taking a call after the second day and I left left a message and I called her every Monday for five months and she called me back finally in June and she said hey a student from MIT didn't show up we're not offering you a job but you can come and interview so I had one suit and a sixty nine Plymouth satellite with like one hundred forty thousand miles on it one hundred forty yeah right and uh, put two dollars worth of gas in it. $2. That's it. That was all you needed them cars, back then, man. Cars ran like horses. Yeah, back 70 cents a gallon. <laughs> uh, and drove out there and got the job. Wow. And it opened my eyes to the world of technology and how technology was going to change what we did. I saw the first, what was in cell phone. 
Oh. Think about this. Oh. This is 1980. And I'm saying the first wireless communication systems in the labs. I'm like, oh, my goodness. How does that change everything? Okay. And it did change everything. We're experiencing things today that were developed at Bell Labs 40 years ago. Think about that. So that changed my life. And uh, so I've always had intellectual curiosity. I've always had, you know, kind of a tenacious spirit. Uh, and I've always had a desire to improve the condition of my family and my, and my community. So you um, go to Cornell, um, major in uh, chemical engineering, correct? Right. You know, kind of give me your, um, you know, not your experience in college, but more so your mindset on what did you want to do? Sure. With that degree. And were you sure exactly where you wanted to head it? Because it seems as if you you came from the educator's background growing up. Um, You have a great sense of self, a great sense of your history and you know, like you said, intellectual curiosity. Uh, did you know exactly what did you want, what you wanted to do? And just kind of walk me through, all right, I'm in college. This is what I'm here for. But this is ultimately where I want to go. That's a great question um, because, you know, I've got some of my kids in college, finished college, going to college, all that sort of stuff. And, and they always ask, Dad, did you know? I'm like, no. So what I, let me tell you what I did know. When I got that job at Bell Labs and I met all these engineers, because I'd never met an engineer before, ever. Right. Mm-hmm. Ever. There weren't any engineers in my neighborhood. Um, I realized that I wanted to be an engineer. Didn't know what type. My mentor, the guy who I worked with at Bell Labs, okay, had a PhD in what was called solid state physics, and his undergraduate was in chemical engineering. Mm-hmm. His most brilliant cat I had met. He had 35 patents to his name. I was like, well, you must learn something in chemical engineering, right? right. So when I get to college, and I understand that the smartest people at Cornell either went into chemical engineering or applied in, in engineering physics, one of the two. Okay. And I looked at both and I saw a little more normalization of personality in the chemical engineering group than the applied in engineering physics group. And all the A&EP folks know what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. <laughs> okay. That's a, a polite way of saying yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. Right. And uh, I learned a very interesting thing that chemical engineers were at the time, and I will argue still are to a great degree, the modern day alchemists. Okay. Because one thing we know how to do is transform matter. We know how to take one form of matter and make something else. Do you guys know how to take oil and make plastic? I do. (laughs) Okay. Sand and make silicon? I do. Okay. Very few people on the planet know how to do that. The new modern day alchemist are software programmers. Right. Think about it. They take an idea and they can code that idea into a substantial existence of being something completely different and have its own ability to transform a business, an economy, an experience from out of thin air. Think about that. Pretty interesting, yeah. right? So did I know I want to be an uh, engineer? Yes. I ultimately decided on chemical engineering, A, because it was, like I said, the hardest curriculum. And I knew that's something I wanted to challenge myself and do. Uh, but I also wanted to learn the elements of that alchemy. How do you transform matter from one form to another? And to continue to go from there, you know, I want to dive deep into how you built Vista. Yeah. And we'll start with, you know, you graduate from college. Um, well, we're going to get to your philanthropic endeavors and yeah. the Given Pledge, which is that's that's the part I get really excited about because the Given Pledge, for those that don't know, is you pledge to give the majority of your wealth away and to give it back mm-hmm. uh, in a philanthropic uh, means. Um, but to do that, you know, we've had many conversations. How do you build up your community? Right. You got to have the means to give back because right. it's going to take a substantial amount of money based on the systematic oppression that we've been dealing with the last 400 years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how do you gain that wealth? Uh, you started with, you work with Kraft, you work with uh, Goodyear, Goldman Sachs, uh, which is interesting. And then you help advise uh, Apple and Microsoft and some mm-hmm. of them, uh, m and right. um, You know, all super well-known companies. So, you know, at each stop, of those companies, uh, what lessons did you learn and, and what did you take from them in order for you to start Vista? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I will unpack parts of it because parts of it's a lot. Mm-hmm. What did I learn? Mm-hmm. 
And you had patents too. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. A number of them. Yeah. Uh, and some trade <laughs> secrets yeah. that were very valuable uh-huh. uh, that we didn't patent because we didn't want the competition to know how to do it. Let uh, me tell you what I learned. Uh, and I'll sum it up. I learned the joy of figuring things out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I tell my kids, I'm going to leave them three things. They're not happy about it some days. <laughs> uh, the first thing my is- My kids, y'all listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. The first thing is an understanding that you are enough. Okay. You are enough to be who you want to be. And you do not need anyone else to say that it's enough and it's okay. Mm-hmm. You are enough. That's the first thing. Second thing is, I want them to discover the joy of figuring things out. Mm-hmm. And the third gift, uh, I hope I can live them to help them understand that love is all that matters. Okay. Now, they keep looking for the asset list (laughs) is the fourth thing. But those are the three things I think that are important. What I learned in my journey uh, is that second, the joy of figuring things out. I like solving complex problems and creating elegant solutions. Like I say, what am I really good at? Creating elegant solutions to complex problems. Vista is just a really elegant solution to a complex problem. Mm -hmm. That complex problem is how do you invest in a way that you have repeatable outcomes? Mm -hmm. What we do is we find these businesses that lend themselves to bringing sets of best practices Mm -hmm. to enable those management teams to accelerate their corporate maturity, grow while being profitable, okay, for profitable growth Mm -hmm. and position those companies to be the leaders in their space and have sustainable outcomes and a sustainability because that's why they're attractive to buyers. Mm -hmm. Because they say, wow, you have created an infrastructure that is sustainable that now I can capture economic benefit from even buying from you at that price where you guys get that return. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. And oh, by the way, that loss ratio. Okay. So what I have learned is think about life through systems. Mm -hmm. Think about creating efficiency in those systems, engineer solutions as opposed to episodic changes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about how I like to teach and impart either what we're doing in Vista or philanthropically is how do you build systems that scale, that have sustainable capacity associated with them? That's how I think that's the lens through which I view like that came from solving systemic problems like working at Kraft General Foods. You know, yeah. we, we had a problem with the, you know, manufacturing of log cabin syrup once. <laughs> okay. And I went and solved that problem. Okay. Or a problem with how we did our manufacturing and our yields for Maxwell House coffee. And I've solved that problem. Mm -hmm. And how we manufacture, you know, how I, you know, solve some problems associated with, with, with the, you know, implementation of computer systems in, 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 uh, in, in process industries to create 30% yield increases in a product that had been produced for 40 years. Mm -hmm. You you see what I mean? So, but when you create a systemic change, you reach a new equilibrium. Yes. And that new equilibrium should be more productive. And so the point is, think about it through that lens as opposed to, oh, let me make a quick change yeah. now. No, think about a systemic change that now has ability to scale. That's how I think about it. So we'll move into investment. So sure. obviously you've been um, a great investor. Obviously you had a great mind for what's, what's good and you know what you want to be a part of. What criteria do you look for or anything specific in that area for a successful investment? Or, you know, what you, what you want to follow up on? Yeah. There are two categories in investments I think about. The investments that I do in Vista, and then I think about my philanthropic investments. Mm. Two categories. Yeah. Okay. The Vista investments for me, we are looking for companies that have the ability to be product leaders in their space, not for quarters or for years, but for decades. And what is it that's keeping them from being that? or enhancing that? And what is it that we can uniquely bring in terms of insights and experiences that can enable that management team to accomplish and achieve those goals and objectives? That's what I look at. 
Okay. We focus on enterprise software because we think about the very nature of that business. You know, it's 95% gross margin business. At the end of the day, you build it once, you sell it many times. Anytime you sell it, you don't use it up. There's no inventory. It's negative working capital. All those sorts of things. And oh, by the way, they're still, most of them are founder led. And often those founders experiences may have one or two experiences, but they haven't captured the plethora of 600 transactions like we have in terms of here's how you now can run that part of your business a little more efficiently than you may have yeah. thought about it in the past. Right. And we can enable you to do it that way so that your management team can be more effective at it. And that's why 70% of the deals that we have at Vista are founder led deals. And 90% of those founders are still with us right. in some way, shape, form, or capacity. It's like, you all have the ability to help me accelerate my corporate maturity mm -hmm. and build systems of scale and infrastructure that I otherwise can't do by myself, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we do uniquely, differently there, and we can do it systemically. As opposed to, oh, we did great on that deal. Not so good on that one, but that one made up that one. No, we have a very consistent uh, track record yeah, I like yeah. that. of what we do. Uh -huh. I don't mean to cut you off, but- Yeah, yeah, sure. Are you looking at the founder or the business? Yeah. Or, and what are you looking for in the founder? Right. Yes and yes. Okay. Okay. The business, we have to, again, we look at what's the addressable market? What's the opportunity set? Is this a product that can have you know, product superiority? Because at the end of the day, the superior products- takes two things to actually really do well in enterprise software, nice. product superiority and execution excellence, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to think about, can you get those two? Now, that's where it comes in the founders and leadership. Can they actually execute? Are they open? Are they listening? Are they in tune? Are they intellectually curious? Do they want to be better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or do they just want to cash out, get some money, go do something else, right? So, I mean, there's all yeah. that dynamic, right? And yeah. that's just, yeah. that's reality. That's and that's that's okay. That's real. And that's okay. Okay. But you just got to know that going in and make your assessment and say, here are the things we can bring to the table. Here's what you can bring to the table. And here's what we think what this company can be if we do this together. Mm -hmm. That's how we think about it. And some say, man, I'm done. I'm tapped out. I've had enough. I'm worn out. I've been doing this 22 years. I got enough. Okay, great. Fine. Let's talk about who needs to now run that business. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah. But that's a conversation. Yeah. It's not a dictated, that's a conversation. So, so what makes you so comfortable? In that position, obviously, it's a leadership position. I see you won a lot, but, you know, like people say, it's been 22 years. I'm tired in this situation. I'm tired in that situation. What makes you so comfortable in both your business investments and your, you know, philanthropic investments to, to lead groups and really change a narrative and change a landscape? That's a great question. Sure that you can do it. On the Vista side, it's because uh, we've just done a lot of deals. We've yeah. done almost six Hundred software transactions wow. completed. Right. Yeah. I'm not talking about looked at. Yeah, talked about. Yeah. <laughs> My vice presidents have done 40, 50 deals. They've closed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Their experience set, that volume set. So we have just done a lot. So we have the confidence and conviction based on things we have done. Mm -hmm. Right. Not based on, oh, we want to do. No, things we have done. We have seen this fact pattern before. Don't get me wrong. Look, if we were in oil and gas and, you know, and insurance and 15 different industries, we may not have that confidence. We may have only worked on one or three or five deals right, in gosh. that space. Uh -huh. We've done 600 in enterprise software. Yes. There's no one who's done that many deals mm -hmm. in one space. Right. Okay. So that's that side of the house. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you yes, see what yes, I mean? Yes. On the other side of, okay, philanthropically and how I think about it, it is you have to take an assessment, to my, in my view, of what can we impact and how can we do it at scale? You know, you said something earlier in the conversation about philanthropy and, you know, and, and capital. And there's part of philanthropy is capital for sure. But I tell my teams all the time, some of the most effective philanthropy we can actually deliver is our organizational thought. Mm -hmm. We know how to organize businesses at scale. Yes. yes. So let's go organize philanthropy at scale. Mm -hmm. So we're not hitting one and two and three and fives with 20s and 30s and 50s and hundreds and thousands and millions of people, which technology can do. I will submit to you some of the work that we do with some of our companies in education. Sure, they're for profit. They're philanthropic in their end goal. At the end of the day, it is to improve the education of the people on this planet. Right. Because the more educated people become, 
the lower the poverty rates are, the more they're able to sustain, you know, economic development in their communities. Mm -hmm. So we should be continuing to expand economic platforms, education platforms to as many communities as we can throughout the world. Mm -hmm. That's part of the work, Mm -hmm. but there's people who know how to do it at scale like us. And there's people where it's just as important that if there's a kid in your neighborhood that nobody's reading him every night or her every night, you should do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a young man. I will tell you that when I grew up, there's a bunch of us in my neighborhood, eight of us, I think is the number. Um, There were seven guys and one, one girl, Marianne. Um, And this guy, African-American male, decided to start a rocket club and teach us about rocketry. Mm -hmm. Paid for it out of his own pocket, took us down to the elementary school, and we built and shot off rockets. Six out of those eight kids became either engineers or scientists. Think about that. Mm -hmm. The impact Mm -hmm. of one person, what it had. Okay, so philanthropically, sure, there's a lot to what we can do, you know, work we do with Lincoln Hills, Intern X, Student Freedom Initiative, you know, Southern Communities Initiative. But it's just as important for people to say, let me take this on and teach this kid down in my neighborhood math or science or rocket, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's just as important that we do that. I want to follow up on that because. um you have a very positive spirit and very positive outlook. And, um, you know, you're a product of uh, desegregation busing. And you hear a lot of, you know, horror stories in that regard. But with you, it seems like you had a positive outlook on hmm. it. And, uh, you know, what part of that was so transformative? And, uh, you know, what did you take away from that experience? That's a, it's interesting. You know, I do have a positive outlook. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, a lot has to do with, I call it the grace uh, that I think has uh, been bestowed on me. And I feel very grateful. You all are here, get a chance to participate in what we call Gratitude Weekend. This is a weekend we're not raising money. We're, what we are doing is being grateful about all that God has given us and what we are able to give to each other as a result of that. I have a very dear friend, um, and he and I talk about it, that we feel blessed to be a blessing. And, you know, segregation uh, was a horrible thing in some respects um, because it created classes of other and people did not get a chance to get to know each other. I remember when I went to Denver East High School, um, well, they started desegregating the schools here uh, when I was in elementary school. Uh, I was one of the first classes, actually first classes of of kindergartners and first graders. Uh, And I remember um, that in my neighborhood, uh, we were supposed to get, I think, three buses, but the night or the two days before, whatever it was, some racist burnt a third of the buses that were supposed to be used for busing, uh, for desegregation. So they only sent one bus to my neighborhood as opposed to three. Okay. And bus number 13, kind of ironically, if you think about it. Right. And so when I look at it, the kids who got on that bus, who went across town to a more richly resourced school on average, did better than the kids who didn't get on the bus. The kids who got on that bus, they became engineers, they became politicians, they went to Ivy League schools. Very few of the kids in our neighborhood who did not get on bus number 13 ended up in that condition. A few did, but very few. Okay. So you start to understand the importance of education and high quality education, in equal education and equal access to education. Those are the things that I point to and see because I experienced it firsthand. Okay, and to me, that's why it's so essential that we continue to enable access to the highest quality education to our community. It makes a difference, a huge difference, a huge difference. I've got a case study that I lived and experienced. Now, as a as a CEO, you know, as a black CEO, um, and one of the few, what surprised you most early? in your career as CEO? Uh, and is there anything about it that, you know, uh, surprises you now as, as a prominent CEO? Growing up how I grew up, very little surprises me about how I am treated as an African-American and as an African-American CEO. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
um, you get disappointed about it sometimes. But it's not surprising because we have experienced this for so long. Um, and you learn that your job, there's a guy by the name of Guy Johnson, uh, who was Maya Angelou's son, who wrote a book that I get probably, I don't know, 100 copies of this book away a year. Mm. Uh, it's called Standing at the Scratch Line. I'll give you guys a copy if I haven't given it to you. Um, and he talks about racism in the book. Mm -hmm. It's fiction, but it's a brilliant, beautiful book, one of my favorites. And he says, racism is like gravity. If you spend too much time thinking about it, it'll weigh you down. Yeah. You just got to keep moving. Mm -hmm. You just got to keep moving. And that's the approach I take. And that's hopefully the, the approach I impart. You're going to find some things. You're going to be swimming upstream. Some people aren't going to like the way you did something, have a mischaracterization of what you did. How you, okay. Keep moving. Y'all know this, right. right? You're in a game. Guess what? Make a mistake. Keep moving. Keep moving. Hopefully you don't get pulled out, yeah. right? Yeah. Keep moving. Keep moving. That's the lesson. Yeah. Our again, solution. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going straight from that point um i had a job with uh, comcast ventures mm -hmm. and i headed up the catalyst fund the catalyst fund was specifically for um investing dollars into underserved or underrepresented founders mm -hmm. um, good yeah you know yeah um, african americans yep. um latinx uh, mm -hmm. female founders but the issue that we found was finding enough of those founders it was just hard finding them in general. Mm -hmm. You know, you went into the tech sector, how much money is directed to underrepresented founders? You know, it might be less than 1%. Oh, it's in the way less than 1%. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, what I think we found was, like you said, you got to find someone who's going to teach kids rockets or you got to put um, – African Americans, females in uh, C suite positions or on board seats to mm -hmm. start finding these, um, building that that on ramp, yeah, to to get people interested, um, and then that leads me to the question of you know how do you look in terms of uh, how do you look for black founders and mm -hmm. uh, black led companies and what's your thinking uh, when you invest in these companies? Um, do do you change your train of thought? Uh, in terms of the other principles you had and other, like you got 600 deals you've got done. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure a majority of those, um, are, especially in SaaS, aren't black led. Right. So, but now we've done the biggest one uh, with Drift was led by two Latinx mm -hmm. and, you know, Rocket Lawyer led by African American male, right? Mm -hmm. Those two deals, $1.2 billion. I don't know of any other fund on the planet that's put that much money into African-American businesses or Latinx businesses. Just point blank, right? But now in software, technology, right. right? Here's the thing. It comes down to you have to think about the entire ecosystem. So we're going to talk about sustainable uh -huh, solutions, right. mm -hmm. these elegant solutions. Yeah. InternX is a part of that because you're, you're right. You know, they're... Now I look at my graduating classes of engineers, very few African Americans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and of course, you look at you know the, the world we're in, it's, it's a technology dominated world. So that's why we created InternX. Why? Internships change your life. We've got 14,000 African American students on our InternX platform. Mm -hmm. 14,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we now have over 200 corporate partners who go to this place to get interns, mm -hmm. right? So anyone who's listening to podcasts, go to Intern XL. I think it's, we're called Intern XL. Yeah. We just, we just uh, renamed it XL as uh, the letters. Um, it's important that we give them the opportunities to see what the world of technology is about, what it is, because that is the world that surrounds them today. But from a producer of the software, the technology, not just a consumer of it. That's how you get these yes. entrepreneurs. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Because we, we, you, you said it earlier this morning and it was like yeah. profound. We have to stop being consumers. Yeah. We got to be producers. Producers. Yeah. Producers of software and technology, but you're not going to just come out of the womb saying, oh, I'm going to do this. You have to have experiences. You have to have those internships mm -hmm. that where you have a chance to see 
with technology and software and how to create it and how to build it. And now it's been easier than ever because now we have what the super scalers out there, you know, AWS's and the Oracle's and the, you know, and the, uh, the Azure's and, mm-hmm. you know, where, okay, guess what? You can use a credit card and get access to all the computing power you want. But what do you do with it? Right. Someone has to teach you. On our intern XL platform, we have 650 learning modules. Mm-hmm. Think about that, where these kids can go on free and learn Python or learn how to program or learn how to do an interview mm-hmm. or learn what AT&T it does for a living. Right. You see right, what I mean? Right, yeah, so right. all those things are important systems that you can just go on to free, gain access to it, understand, educate, mm-hmm. okay, inform yourselves, you know, discover the joy of figuring things out and now go get an internship. And start getting on that journey at scale, mm-hmm. at scale. That's how we think about it. That's how I think about it. Oh, yeah. So we'll, we'll break in deeper, obviously, into philanthropic work. But, yep. you know, one thing that you did in 2019 that, you know, set the world on fire was you cleared out the debt for the 2019 Morehouse College. Yeah. And you followed that up with the student initiative. Fund. Mm-hmm. You go, you know, deeper into what, you know, clearing out that debt meant and why you were able to do that. And, yeah. you know, the, everybody sees it on the surface, but. You know. Yeah, you should. So it'd be fun. So I, I have a meeting with the uh, the Morehouse class the last Thursday of every month. And um, we do a two hour call. Uh, and they can ask whatever questions. They have. Some have guest speakers. And all. You guys should come on sometime. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's next week. Yeah. Um, and they ask every question from how do I go get a raise from my boss? to How do I start a business? How do I rate, you know, how do I go? you know, create a banking relationship so I can borrow money for my business. I mean, it's real life kind of stuff. So you guys, I think you got to come on. I think they'd appreciate yes, uh, hearing from you. Um, but what you see is a liberation. It's a liberation of a human spirit. And I don't think there's anything greater. A liberation of I can go now do some things that I otherwise was burdened and I couldn't before. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah, that's the point of it. Right. And so what we've done with the Student Freedom Initiative is saying, you know, because look, the, the 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 facts are, African Americans graduate with more debt. That takes them longer to pay it off. Yep. Typically, three years, four years after, four years after they 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 actually have more debt because of the way the compound interest works and how much they paid off. They typically get a job that pays them less, right. and so that forestalls their ability to actually create will real wealth in buying a house, buying stocks, bonds, you know. Uh, uh, any form of securities that could actually build wealth in their families. And most of these uh, students didn't come from wealth, so they don't have any wealth to rely on. And right. their parents and grandparents went into debt. So what we did with uh, Student Freedom Initiative is said, listen, let's create, it's called a, it's an uh, income contingent fund. But basically what it is, it's a fund where you can borrow from that fund and you pay back to the fund, not to the government, yes. to the fund. Yes. And now that recycles back into the community. Yes. If, for instance, though, you decide to become a teacher in your neighborhood and, you know, elementary school and you're not making enough to pay back, you know, if you do 20 years of that, guess what? You paid it back as far as we're concerned. Mm -hmm. You you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it is a way that our community can create a self-sustaining funding model for us to get educated. We focus on STEM students. We're hitting every HBCU. Mm -hmm. um, uh, And MSI, you know, Minority Serving Institution, and provide that, that capital. And so we've now had, you know, I've, I've you know, between myself, Fund 2 Foundation, um, uh, $100 million and uh, Cisco has now put $100 million into it. Now another $50 million we're using to actually create broadband access for all HBCUs. You guys don't know this because I didn't know it until two years ago, which is why we're solving the problem. 82% of HBCUs are in a broadband desert. Mm. Think about that. In a world where technology is critically important, 82% of our historically black colleges and universities are in a broadband desert. And so now we are working the Student Freedom Initiative to ensure that all HBCUs and the students have broadband access. Okay, so now we took that on as a separate mission because you can't participate in the new economy if you don't have access to broadband, plain and simple, right? It makes no sense. Yeah, so we're solving that problem. So, I mean, look, this is what I talk about solving solving problems at scale. Yes. And you know, if we get once well, well not if once we get all of the HBCUs up and running on that, I mean, you think about now these students have access. Now they have access to the computing capacity mm-hmm. that they otherwise wouldn't. Mm-hmm. And now you can unleash and liberate their minds of creativity and entrepreneurship and the ability to now go drive, you know, opportunities forward. 
you know, uh, a friend of mine, Pinky, she just announced it was at, at Clark University or Atlanta University. You oh, know, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah everybody's going to get an LLC, right? We think about uh -huh. it. All right, great. Now, which is a great thing, and I really admire her for that. And it's important that these students realize what gift that is to think about life through the lens of an entrepreneur. But if you don't have access to technology to create platforms or create yeah. models or solutions to deliver your products or expand your market area or to make more efficient your accounting, uh, it, it's a tougher, tougher, tougher sled. I will give you one statistic that we do. Uh, the average enterprise software solution that we sell gives our average customer 640% ROI, return on investment. That's our average product that we sell to our average customer. To a small to medium business, it's over 900% return on investment for software that they buy. Okay? So if you're a small business and you are not using software, to enable your business to be effective, yeah. you're going to be, you know, non-competitive ultimately. Correct. And so it's important that we think about mm -hmm. producing software to sell to our small and medium businesses that are uniquely tuned to our, you know, what our businesses are, and we're selling it. Mm -hmm. So that's why that ecosystem is important. I want to talk about, in, it just came to my mind, endowments. Yeah. And especially in HBCUs. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how do we solve for that issue? And I want to talk about accountability too within our community. Yeah, with how we manage our funds, right? With things like endowments, because yeah. we, you know, um, all our um, black eye issues in terms of how we handle our finances, in terms of how we consume, over consume, or how we mismanage our funds. Um, how do we solve for that issue, especially with you know, you look at some of these great institutions of higher education, uh, especially the Ivy Leagues, you know, how do we start looking at how they build their endowments? And, you know, it's just the universities almost seem like it's run as a business and we just become, we just yeah. uplift everybody that's within the institution. So let me, let me unpack some parts of that. If you add up all the endowments for all the HBCUs, it's smaller than the, than the smallest endowment of, the Ivy League, mm -hmm. the, of, of the smallest Ivy League school, mm -hmm. point one. So we took this on. We said, okay, here's what we got to do. We started unpacking it, and a lot of them had constraints as to what they could invest in. Now, if you think about it, over the last 25, 30 years, 40 years, the best investments were in financial securities, stocks, bonds, mm -hmm. okay, but mainly stocks mm -hmm. in that context, mm -hmm. in terms of asset appreciation. Yes. Well, they were prohibited based on charters to do that. Wow. Most of the HBCUs. So- Dr. Richardson over at Virginia Union, he and I talked about this a year and a half ago. We said, this is just wrong. Okay. Right. Now you've got to go through a process where you now have to get from the board, you know, the ability to change your investing criteria for your endowments. You can now invest in stocks or alternatives, mm -hmm. private equity, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff in order to participate in what was the greatest capital expansion on the history in the history of this world. Our endowments could not actually participate. So we formed a group. Includes a number of asset managers like myself, mm -hmm. okay, and also advisors that help these boards now convert. We've now converted six of them. So now they have the ability to do this. This is all real time. This is happening like as we sit here okay. today. Mm -hmm. Dr. Richardson and others have said, okay, now that we've done that, we are now going to allocate over 60% of the dollars for those endowments to African-American managers. Okay. Now yes. think about it. Yes. In the investment world, less than 1% of the dollars actually go to African-American managers. So you think about there are certain cities, you know, in California, Los Angeles, and others, where 50, 60% of the contributions to those pension plans are black and brown people, but less than 1% is managed by black and brown people. Now think about it. That's just wrong. Yes. It's just wrong. Okay. So at least the HBCUs are now saying, now let's take that and start putting that capital into fund managers of the grandchildren and children of those who have run those institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the dynamic. So that's what's happening today. And it's critically important because as you build those endowments, they have the ability to be much more flexible in how they actually, you know, hopefully they're investing in firms that are, you know, returning capital, which I know because our, our firms are really doing well in terms of our uh, 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 member organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, they can now be more thoughtful about how to utilize that capital not only to educate, but enable those citizens, those students to participate in the next generation of economies and economic activity. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're working on. Mm -hmm. So I heard a story. I think you can say yes or no, but you said, uh, I read that when you were younger, your mother, regardless of your financial situation, would donate $25 every month to uh, 
you know, that not an Negro college fund. Yeah, yeah. Negro college yeah, yeah. Fund. Is mm-hmm. that something that really drove you on top of the story of your grandfather saying your mom being able to it was get admitted to college and yeah, a lot like, had to, yeah help I'll t- everybody. I tell you, Evan, it was, again, it was just the community I grew up in. You know, yeah. I just that my mom did that. My dad, you know, was chairman of the YMCA. That's where we all, you know, sold candy and you know to 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 enable you know, the, the pool to be operational and you know, we're able for us to have, you know, build a gym and we built a gym. Okay. We, we built that in our community, raising money, doing the work, doing the lift. So kids had a place to go to learn how to play basketball or, you know, yeah. baseball or have summer activities and a place to go that was safe. And that's what it was about. It was, you had, you know, my parents were very involved in the Head Start programs. Okay. You know, starting those up, making sure very involved in, in the program. So kids had a, a breakfast before they went to school in the morning if they didn't. I mean, I, I saw that every day. This wasn't, yeah. you know, we talk about philanthropy. It wasn't, oh, it's episodic. I wrote a check. No, it's every day. What are you doing to yeah. enable your community to be more successful right. and healthier and stronger and more capable? And that's just the nature of how the black community I grew up in was, right? right? Yeah. That's just what it was. So, so during this time, um, obviously, you do a lot of fundraisers and before things jump off and, you know, you go into rooms where it's different colors of people that might not identify with some of the struggles and hurdles we've had to come across in the mm-hmm. past and still, how do you get people to see your side or even get them to, you know, donate and get behind your cause or you have a 2% theory and be like, yo, this is, this is what we need because this is yeah, right I- much more. Is it? At the beginning, it had to be some resistance in that sense. And there still is. Yeah, 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 yeah. As logical as it sounds, you know, our, our <laughs> right. you're right. Um, our Southern Communities Initiative, uh, which I partnered now with, you know, Dan Schulman over at PayPal and Rich Lesser over at BCG and, you know, a few others. And what we did was we just kind of unpacked. You know, we take these Southern communities to a hundred mile radius around these cities. You get to 50% of the black population. Now, what do they need, right? And it's enablement of capital, enablement of digital systems. And, and so we're working on that, right? And I would think every corporation on the planet or in the world, in the U.S. at least, would say this makes a ton of sense and it works because um, it does work, yeah. right? You, we, we show you digitize a CDFI, Community Financial Development Institute, and MDI, guess what? They can lend out orders of magnitude more money and not increase the risk on the money in, you know, that they're lending out. Mm. And it changed the economic condition of that community. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. And you think, okay, well, we do that with one of our companies because it's you know, economic and all that sort of stuff. But now it's, it's okay help these communities do this. And so, you know, we've got like Ramin Foundation to partner with NAACP. So now we're doing it for African-Americans in these communities as opposed to kind of anybody who shows up, right? And so you just got to build infrastructure and scale and systems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, proof of the pudding is always in the eating, you know what I mean? And just show people it works. And some will get on board. Some will sit back and say, oh, it's not my idea. But, you know, like all like we we're talking about, you know, it's like gravity, man. You just got to keep going. Yeah, right? Absolutely. You know, go solve the problem yeah. and change the condition of people's lives. Well, I, I hopefully, you know, and I'll end it with like simplicity. Yeah. And, you know, we've gotten feedback from our listeners in terms of sometimes we get, um, may not be understanding the verbiage or, you know, understand, you know, how we speak in terms of uh, investing mm-hmm. um, or how we thinking about, uh, a founder, we might go above, you know, their train of thought. Um, but there's access now, you know, digitally in terms of people being able to invest. You know, you got you know, Robin Hood, you know, mm-hmm. there, it's becoming more of a retail investor. You know, you got meme stock, you know, yeah. the, the retail investor becomes smarter. You know, mm-hmm. they went and said, all right, let's let's go and they trying to kill GameStop. <laughs> let's go over there and reverse. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. it was almost like they, they you know, uh, against Wall Street, you know, mm-hmm. they banded yeah. together. But now they're doing it, you know, mobily. Now they're doing it digitally. Um, Two thirds of Americans uh, live paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. You know what I mean? And at the same time, uh, the wealth is becoming more concentrated with the few. You know, yeah. we know how that works. Mm-hmm. You know, it's less than 1% of uh, fund managers are right. uh, African-Americans. Um, how do we open up investment opportunities 
uh, for the average American to allow them to, you know, participate in long-term wealth as a as a as a retail investor. Because I know you deal mostly with uh, institutions, private, yeah, yeah right, institutions and, and, yeah. and private equity. Right. You know, how do we get um, our community to, you know, what's your overall theme in terms of getting them to, you know, all right, we're consumers, but mm-hmm. let's take a, that some of that consumption and, you know, and diversify yeah. your portfolio, not just buying stuff. But investing in the long term. Yeah, there's there's multiple levels of that, uh, Dre. I mean, so one of them is, you know, I I support um, uh, one of our uh, groups called Goal Setter. Okay, and you, I think you guys have met Tanya, Tanya Van Cor. She was just here as part of our restoration retreat, uh, educating young people on financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's an application that you can now use Goal Setter, Mm -hmm. uh, and teaching you the importance of how do you now. Think about your consumptive patterns. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Can you take five dollars a week and actually invest it in a savings account, invest it in stock, or go buy, you know, something at the store? Compound investing is the ninth one of the world. You got <laughs> it, right? You got it, right? So her systems, her tools, all of that are built towards that. And then I said, okay, time let's do one better, which we did for Eagle Academy. And we said, all right, let's give, we gave one share of stock of every one of the Vista uh, public companies to all the students. And faculty and administrators yes, and that. staff mm-hmm. of Eagle Academy. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're about to do this again for another group here. And so it's educating and helping people understand. And part of her mission then is okay, now let's go get stock from, you know, a bunch of different corporations. You all do the same thing, pledge and let us get a million brown people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Be stockholders. Yes. And now you can start to understand it if you see it. It's like, like I said, if I hadn't had a chance to work in Bell Labs, I wouldn't understand or would have had a chance to understand tech. But well, so now you end up, say you have a, a stock and you're kind of watching it and it goes up and it goes down and you start following the earnings. Guess what? Yes. You're going to start to understand yes. that market and have a curiosity in it and probably say, man, this is an interesting way. I'm going to tell you a story. So back when I was a kid, I was, you know, I was a sweeper boy, right? So I used to sweep. So I went to junior high school, go to junior high school, no longer exists. Uh, you know, go to school, have wrestling practice, and then I'd sweep the floors. That was my job, right? And then all of a sudden I was getting checks, I had a couple hundred dollars and five hundred dollars, all that sort of stuff. So what do I do with this? And it was a place called World Bank, and this was during a high inflation. And I went down and they were actually having passbook savings accounts paying 10, 11, 12%. I'm like, well, what is that? Okay, you put this money in and you get 10% if you don't touch it. Huh. Okay, do I trust this bank? And I had to take the bus down. I was like, okay, I put the money in the bank and guess what? Next month, yeah, man, it went up. Okay, and then I said, well, and they talked to me things about these things called certificates of deposit. Mm-hmm. What's that? If you lock it up for a longer period of time, you actually get more interest on it. And I said, okay, well, I don't really need this money right now. So I'll lock it up for six months. And guess what? You made 11%. And I'm like, man, this is pretty good. So I actually, at some point in time, was making a little more money on interest than I was making working every day. Right. Okay. When you learn that when you're age 13, 14, 15, you start understanding the power of compound interest and the power of financial securities yeah. and all. You see what I mean? Yeah. But if you never saw that, you How buy, would you know? You buy some Jordans. Yeah. 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 Some right. some Jordans, man. You go yeah. get you a Pelly Pelly. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So you speak a lot on, obviously, you you have it. What's uh, a Pelly Pelly? I don't know. A Pelly Pelly in Chicago is a leather coat. Oh, okay. I was like, what's a Pelly Pelly? You wear that with a buck 50. My side dudes know it. Okay. I see. I just learned something. Okay. I don't know if they're black and black on. Yeah. But, um. I was saying, obviously, you seem like you have it all figured out in business and somewhat philanthropy, but uh, philanthropic. But the harder task for all parents, yeah. how are you gonna go about man? You know, it's teaching hard. Your kids about wealth and wealth management. It's hard. I got a story just teaching, for that. You know, yeah, it's different. yeah, yeah. Because I need your help on this. Yeah. So if um, I can help. <laughs> so um, you know, my wife is on me. Yeah, come help with these kids. Yeah. I'm like, all right, you're right. I can't argue with that. <laughs> But sometimes the work to be calling. So I say, my son's 15. Yeah. My youngest is five. I say, man, you babysit for me. He said, all right, cool. I said, hey, I just need you for like two hours. That's it. Yeah. And uh, I was <laughs> like, um, I'll give you $100. Yeah. 
No, I was like, you fit, I go get you some uh, five. I said, I go get you some five guys. Yeah. He said, oh, I'm, I'm in. Bet. Yeah. Five guys for an hour. That's a bunch of hype, right? hyper five-year-old. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I, five, I was like, I go get the five guys, bring it back. Right there on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. You got to watch it next morning. So then I then I look at my schedule. I said, no, nah, I don't need it for an hour. I need it for two hours. So I said, I'm going to make it better. I said, nah, scratch that. I'm going to give you $100 for two hours yeah. instead of five guys for an hour. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me like... <laughs> I don't know, Pops. I don't, I don't. <laughs> no, this is what he said. He said, yeah. I'll do the two hours, but I don't want the $100. I want the five guys. <laughs> I, said, yeah. I said, what? Oh, yeah. what? I said, son, you know how much five guys you can get with $100? Yeah. And, he, and I was like, I figured it out. I said, you don't need money, do you? He was like, I mean, no. Nah, I, 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 I don't need no money. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> right. And, yeah, I, and I was like. He gave you that money back when he went on a date. Yeah. Right. You're like, bro, who don't take $100? Don't don't take, tr- he, he was like, I only need $30. I don't need $100. Right. Help me. I don't <laughs> help me with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For Christmas, yeah. he asked like a $10 tour. You like, bro, why am I out here doing that? <laughs> right. right. No, that's a challenge, right? I mean, the, the good news is we are now, you all, and I okay, there's, there's 1,500 African-American males that get four billion, $4.1 billion a year. Mm-hmm. That's y'all. Yes. It's great. And I've been trying to repeat that. Dude, it is great. Mm-hmm. Okay. The next piece of that is how do you translate that into generational wealth, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Education is critically important on that. You know, goal setter apps, those mm-hmm. sort of things. So he starts to understand, right? Okay, we also have to create realistic consumptive patterns for them where they have to earn things. People don't appreciate what they don't earn. Right. You know that, right? Right. If you give it to them, they, mm-hmm. but if they earn it. No matter what it is, and it's 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 a journey every day, um, and you know I deal with it with 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 my kids all the time. So it's the business is like today. I think I told you, you know, my son's going to now come back and present some of the work that he's doing on some real estate investment evaluation. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay, great. You gotta do that mm-hmm. and say, all right, you know, look, I don't know what I'm expecting here right now, but um, I know his intentions are good. <laughs> uh, looking for a billion, man, to yeah. get started. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we break it out of small, but, but part of it is also, um, I call it the club effects. I mean, you guys, so think about how you get your kids of similar ages to learn this together. Right. Gamify yeah. it. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes, yes. It's like, okay, guess what, you guys, you know, Take your kids and say, all right, you know, it's going to be 8, 10, 12. Now have a competition. Maybe do it in NBA. All, all y'all's kids are in F- and different levels, say, stock picking, bond picking, portfolios every quarter. You all give something that they value as a prize. Guess what? I bet you their focus will turn. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. So be creative about it and say, okay, whoever does the best in the 11 to 13-year-old category gets one of your rings. Hey, man. Well, I, you're giving me one for this interview, so I don't know. No, anyway, I, I, you only got like three left, I got right? Got a couple of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got, well, you got four, <laughs> right? I got four. That's that sounds all right. Yeah, yeah right. Do that. But anyway, but, but think of something like that. Yes. That is, you know, create the incentive that that is valuable to them, and create a learning environment, and then you guys can get involved in in the process. You can do it all digitally on Zoom. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yes, yes, yes. So do something like that. I mean, just That's an dope. idea. Let me yeah. not, no, I'll I'm, participate. That'll be fun. Okay. Now, Andre, right. I know you don't like when dad kills you. I know you, you got the job. You got a summer job. Yeah, yeah. And he did a really good job and he made a good amount of, he made some real money, money I right. never made at his age. And I said, what you going to buy with it? He said, I just want this nice junk. I just want this uh, track suit and then I just save the rest. Good. So I'm like, all right, we get yeah. it. So I ain't gonna, I'm going to give you the good part, son. Yeah, but now now get him investing. <laughs> yes, and yes, yeah, yes, I mean, yes. I, I cracked him. So it's like the other, you know, like my son, you know, he works here at the ranch uh, and he earned some money and all that. So I was giving him the cash. He's like, dad, what am I going to do with that? He's like, you got to put it on my digital, on my, on my Apple watch, whatever. <laughs> you know, right? yeah, it was kind of interesting. I was like, yeah. okay, Apple Pay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay. So now it's like, he's like, I only buy three things digital. So yeah. that kind of tells you, right? right? Okay, son, yeah, now, you know, handing him cash was useless. It was funny. I was talking with Michael Jordan about this. Like, you know, okay, yeah, giving kids cash is useless. They're like, what, what am I going to do right. with that? That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, get, put it on my phone. Put it up, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, but that just yeah. tells you where our kids need to be and where we need to be in terms of them participating in the digital economy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's and, a dynamic. And close it out. Last question. Yeah. What's the hardest part about being Robert F. Smith? Oh, man. Uh, like, like you said, the demands of family versus what you think about as the demands of community. They're, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Like, I mean, I was late here this morning because my daughter's 
you know, they wanted me to spend some time with them. Yeah, I yeah. I get it. And so I said, I'm going to spend some time with y'all. And I'll come see y'all a little later. Yeah. No, no, right? Should be, yeah. That's right. I mean, like I said, it's very, look, you know, I wish like all things our country had a different view as it manifests on race and we wouldn't have to have the kind of conversations we have. Right. And I hope one day we won't have to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. It'll be based on people's ability and all those sorts of things. Um, but man, you got to go do the lift. Yes. And hopefully, hopefully, you know, our, your generation, you guys are a couple years younger than me, uh, and the generation of our kids have to do less of a lift on that so they can do more of a lift on the enablement of opportunity for all Americans. And I think that's what we should be focused on. Yeah. yeah. Anything for us? Questions for us? Use your platform. Mm -hmm. um, use your platform to educate, which I know you all do. And I think, think about creating, I like this idea of sustainable um, education systems for your kids. Again, you got 15, there's more than y'all now, but 1500 plus of y'all who get that much capital every year, be efficient in the utilization of that mm -hmm. for the purposes and goals that you're after. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd say. There's, ve there's very few communities of that size that get that much money yeah. every year. Well, this is a very powerful episode. Um, we talk about podcasts uh, as a business, as a space, and you know how the catalog works. And this is this episode will stand the test of time. Yeah. So we truly appreciate you and the value you brought to us. Thanks, um, guys. We can be of value any time. We at your disposal. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it, guys. You. Yeah, thank, thank you for being here. Yes, and enjoy you. the weekend, gratitude weekend, and you know, really, you know, enjoy what Lincoln Hills has and what it is. Thank you. Really right. great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys. Until Thanks. Until next time.